performance roller coaster. We're going to talk about making CocoaPod, uh, CocoaPods fast with modern Ruby tooling. Samuel Giddings is going to uh, tell us about performance, how to write performant Ruby code um, for speeding up CocoaPods at scale. Samuel has a background in mathematics and economics from U Chicago loves cooking and right now works at Square, helping mobile developers have a great, having a great development experience. He fiddles with Bundler and CocoaPods when he's not on the clock. Welcome, Samuel. So, fun story. Uh, when I submitted this talk, I just said, making CocoaPods fast or faster. And uh, the, the organizer said, well, um, sounds like an interesting talk. I don't know that anyone's going to think it has anything to do with Ruby. Um, so I promise it does. Um, the with modern Ruby tooling bit you'll see is, is a bit of a fudge. i um, going to talk about both tooling and also, you know, sort of software development practices as a whole. Um, so what spawned this talk? Um, Writing performant code is hard. Writing performant Ruby code that does a lot of stuff is really hard. Um, I think a bunch of the talks we've seen so far this weekend have confirmed that. Um, and so CocoaPods got to be pretty slow at scale. And this is a bit of the story of how we made CocoaPods bearable. So I'm at S.E. Giddens everywhere on the internet. You may have seen my name in connection with a few open source projects before. Um, about a year ago, I joined the mobile developer experience team at Square, where it's my job to keep all of our iOS developers happy and productive. Uh, I do an OK job at that. Um, you might have also seen my name or you know my face uh, on Bundler and Ruby Gems issues and pull requests. Uh, I've even obsessed a bit about performance in those projects, but I'm not here today to talk about them. So what is this CocoaPods thing, and why is this guy up on stage talking about it here at a Ruby conference? So CocoaPods is a pretty big command line tool. It's all built in Ruby, uh, and it is a dependency and package manager for the Apple ecosystem, for developers in the app, Apple ecosystem. So where I work at Square, we've got a pretty big set of iOS apps, and they're pretty big. Um, so running our pod install command would take about three minutes on a brand new MacBook Pro. Um, and that was really bad. People were unhappy, and it was time to dive in and try and help boost my team's productivity. So with the help of some amazing tools, some patience, um, and vague recollections of how like computer science works, uh, we managed to cut the time it takes to run the CocoaPods command in half. Um, by changing less than 200 lines of code, we saved 90 seconds per pod install. And all via the sorts of performance improvements that you can find in basically any Ruby library. So CocoaPods is basically what would happen if you took Ruby gems, you took Bundler, and you smashed them together. That's essentially the job it performs for the Coco community. It's both a package manager and a dependency manager. So it combines a definition of how libraries work, a pod spec, with a way to integrate them into a user's application, a pod file. So this might be sounding familiar. Um, if you take the word pod in anything in CocoaPods and replace it with gem, you'll probably be able to understand what I'm talking about pretty easily, and this is no coincidence. So just by way of comparison, so, you know, Ruby Gems has a gem spec, CocoaPods has a pod spec. Bundler has a gem file and a gem file.lock. CocoaPods has the same thing. Um, except there's, there's like one extra little row here. And that little difference is a, a friend of mine called Xcode. So, have any of you 
had the pleasure of opening up and using Xcode before. I, I see some hands, but I heard a really big sigh. And uh, I understand. So Xcode is Apple's proprietary tool chain for compiling apps for Apple platforms. So if you have an iPhone, all of your iOS apps were built using Xcode. So it uses its own strange little manifest file format. Um, I am way too familiar with it, given that I wrote a parser for it a couple of years ago. That was a mistake. It was buggy. Um, and it goes ahead and invokes many, 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 many compilation tools, things such as a C compiler, a Swift compiler, an asset catalog compiler, a managed object model compiler, a linker, um, all these sorts of things that fortunately in the Ruby world we don't have to deal with. So while that table made it look like CocoaPods is pretty similar in functionality to, to Ruby Gems and Bundler, it actually has to do a heck of a lot more because writing a build system for a compiled static language is simply a lot more effort than downloading and untarring a bunch of files and manipulating a global variable or two at runtime and calling it a day. Okay, so as you may guess, you know, you run bundle install when you want to install something from a gem file. Any guesses as to what you'd run if you want to install something from a pod file? Just shout it out. Yeah, pod install. We, we were super original. So this is sort of what running pod install will look like for you. So it, it'll go ahead and fetch specifications, fet, you know, fetch metadata about all the different pods. It'll go ahead and do some dependency resolution. It actually uses the same algorithm for dependency resolution that Bundler and RubyGems use. Um, it's not really a coincidence because I'm the one who authored it. Um, it you know, goes and downloads those dependencies. It puts them in the right place on disk. So all this is really familiar to us. Uh, and then it goes ahead and it generates a project for Xcode. Now, this step, when I started working at Square, would take over two and a half minutes. This is the meat of what CocoaPods was doing. And then it would go ahead and just sort of integrate all of that. Okay, great, CocoaPods exists. Sam, you've told me it's slow. So what, it's slow, it's fine. Why? focus on performance. I, I know this may seem like a silly question to ask. Of course we want things to be fast, but I think it's important for us to examine why we actually are talking so much about performance here this weekend, why it's something that's a, you know, a top of mind for so many developers, really no matter what ecosystem you're talking about. So one of the reasons why it's a common conference talk subject is performance generally doesn't sort of get better on its own. It takes a lot of active work. And you also typically don't accidentally fix performance problems. Um, so it's something that we really need to think about. But before we start thinking, like performance optimization is fun, at least to someone like me. Uh, it's really cool to go, okay, so we have all the features we need. We've got all our tests already. Um, we have users, like they're using it. All I need to do is make this thing faster. I can like go and change whatever I want so long as I get to the end goal of the thing is faster. Now, from sort of the business perspective, Rapid iteration, no matter what tool set you're using, means you have happier and more productive developers. That means money to you know, your boss, and that's important. There's also this notion of scale, which is when the set of things that you're working with gets bigger 
how much worse does performance get? And as I said earlier, free performance is hard to find. It's something you really have to work for. Okay, so this maybe is sounding applicable. So you say, okay, I have a slow Ruby app. How do I make it faster? So funny enough, the first question you should probably be asking yourself is, is my app really slow? What's it actually doing? Is it doing something that's inherently complex? Is it doing something that inherently requires a lot of compute power or a lot of time? Something like downloading 20 gigabyte files from the internet is never going to happen instantly. How often does your app run? If it runs, you know, once a day, if it's an endpoint that only, you know, one, one person in the company hits once a month to get some stats, who really cares if it's slow? And sort of a corollary to that is, would improving performance actually make a perceptible difference? Now, the easy thing is sort of, OK, I have something that's slow. I've decided I care about it. Can I cheat at the problem and just redefine what it is my app is trying to do and make it do less work? Can I say, like, oh, hey, my app is no longer responsible for downloading things from the internet. You, you just point it at a file, and it'll do something. Well, that'll make it faster. And finally, how can you keep things that are slow from getting worse? Um, this is something that often gets overlooked. It's one thing to sink a bunch of time into improving performance, but if you're going to let that, those gains sort of erode over time, that's not a great position to be in. You want to be in a situation where you can make improvements and have them stick. So another way of thinking this is, how much would you be willing to invest to make your app a little bit faster, a fair bit faster, a lot faster? How much would you pay a developer or a SaaS company to say, your app's workload could now be instant? And it's important to keep this in mind, because improving performance is always a trade-off between you know, making things faster, or spending that time fixing bugs, or writing new features. Finally, how do you know what part of what your app is doing is slow? Is it the important part that you care about? Is it some ancillary part? Um, it's hard to fix problems that you don't really have a good grasp of what's wrong. And so the, the typical way this goes about is like, Huh, this, this thing feels slow. Um, and then maybe you like pull out a stopwatch or use the time command. Say, oh, you, this, this web page took 10 seconds to load. I guess 10 seconds is pretty slow. And then maybe it's like, oh, well, like loading and evaluating this one massive JavaScript file, my web page took 10 seconds. And then finally, you can you know, drill in and get some really deep understanding, some, some really hard numbers of what's going on under the hood. And so that last bit, that last set of numbers, typically comes about through an activity called profiling. So profiling is kind of the art of putting numbers to the feeling of something is slow. It's a lot easier to talk concretely about numbers uh, of, in terms of performance than the feeling of this feels slow or this feels a lot faster than it used to. So great, what can I profile? Well, you can profile method calls. You can sample call stacks. You can profile memory allocations, disk I.O., network I.O., database queries, garbage collection, Basically, you can profile anything. Um, all of these, it turns out, are really useful tools for profiling different sorts of performance problems in Ruby apps. So my work on CocoaPods focused specifically on 
two of these things. And, and this is, you know, since I'm sort, sort of telling the story of what happened uh, about a year ago in a particular project to make Cocoa Pods faster, um, this isn't all I've used. All of these tools are great, um, but, you know, right tool for the right job. Um, so a, a really quick aside, um, one of our contributors about a year ago decided to run CocoaPods under a memory profiler and found out that we allocated something like hundreds of millions of objects that we didn't need to. And by cutting that down, um, you know, by changing a couple of lines of code, we got huge performance gains on a synthetic benchmark he had created. So profilers are kind of like most tools that we use. It's really important to pick the right one for the problem you're trying to solve. So the standard profiler, um, something like a, a Ruby prof, uh, will tell you how many times a method was called and usually how much time was spent in each of those method calls. Uh, that's great. It's really helpful. It's a great starting point, but using a tracing profiler can distort relative numbers. If whatever you're profiling happens to, have, to occur in a tight loop, you'll see that those numbers are getting higher and higher because there's overhead when you're tracing something. Uh, it can also make running a program truly painfully slow. Um, here's a, an anecdote. So someone asked if they could help look into a performance issue on GitHub, and uh, one of our contributors said, yeah, you know, run Ruby profits. Great. That's how I found issues. Um, and then about 10 minutes later, he came back and said, I, you know what, maybe that wasn't the best idea. If it took 35 minutes without profiling, it'll never finish with you know, Ruby prof, sorry, don't do that. So sort of a, a twist on that is an allocation profiler, which will trace memory allocations instead of method calls. And it's, they sort of suffer from the same problems as tracing profilers, but even more so if you're trying to profile a Ruby app, because Ruby really likes to allocate new objects. Then we get to sampling profilers. So they work by taking a peek at your program at regular intervals, maybe every 10 milliseconds, but from outside the program. They don't require hooking into any you know, method calls. And that's really great if you're trying to profile something in production, for example. So they generally won't interfere at all with your app's normal execution, presuming they're bug-free, um, but it's also possible for them to miss things. You know, it's luck whether or not you end up taking a sample at exactly the right time when a method is at the top of the stack. Uh, they also can't really tell you how many times something has been called. They basically just say, ah, so, you know, I sampled every 10 milliseconds for 10 seconds, and here are all the stack traces every time I looked. And that's really all a sampling profiler can tell you. What was at the top of the stack at the time it took a look? And now here's um, a term that I'm coining, a manual profiler. This is basically the equivalent of you running the time command or taking out your stopwatch. And why would you ever want to use something manual? We're programmers, we're supposed to be lazy, and we're supposed to look for tools to do things for us, right? Well, sometimes it's easiest to understand the output from a tool you've written yourself, even if it isn't fancy. So, for example, who here is like wrapped a call to a method in a benchmark.measure block. Yeah, and it's super helpful, right? Because it tells you one number. It says how long you spent inside that block. That's really easy to understand. Now, doing this sort of analysis can help you focus in on what you already suspect is you know, a problem in your code. And it's also more likely to tell you some specific information that you won't get 
when you have this deluge of stuff from running something like RubyProf. Something like maybe you call one method 10,000 times. And on the first time you call it, it takes a long time because it computes something. The other 9,999 times, it's basically instant. Well, there's some information there that you might want, which is one of these calls took a long time. So yeah, that's, that's the example of when that becomes useful. So I really obviously like this approach. And um, you know, being very lazy, I decided I would build a tool to make not building a tool easier. Um, so I called it chronometer. Um, mostly because I, you know, was searching for things that had time-related names available on rubygems.org, and this was all I could find. So, okay, chronometer. It allows you to just wrap a method with some timing and recording infrastructure. It'll look and say, ah, yes, I started at this time and ended at this time. Here were, here were my parameters. Here was the return value. Shove that off into a list of these things, and that's it. It can output results in a format that's compatible with Chrome's uh, tracing view, which is typically used for profiling you know, web page loads. Um, so you don't have to, you know, I, well, you don't. I, more importantly for me, I didn't have to build anything to visualize uh, what was happening. And it also happens in process. So you can write code that uses these timing results and do something like maybe send them up to a server so you have a log of them and you can graph them and you can you know, ask for more people to work on your thing when it's getting slower. So um, I'm really into the file thing. Um, so th there's, you know, I, I added a chrono file. Um, basically gives you this, this DSL that, that says, okay, measure these methods from this class. That's basically all it does. Okay, so lots of different types of profilers. Um, for me working on CocoaPods, this meant that I was using a mix of RubyProf, um, which is sort of the, the standard Ruby profiler that I'm sure a lot of us reach for. Um, you know, it's a tracing profiler. Um, RB Spy, which is this amazing sampling profiler that Julia Evans published about a year ago, and Chronometer. So all three of them are great. Uh, I used all of them extensively last year. Uh, there would be times I'd be running, you know, pod install in three different windows using three different tools to profile. Um, but knowing sort of the difference between them would have saved me a bunch of time uh, you know, for example, trying to memory profile CocoaPods meant that I would be sitting in front of my laptop overnight. Um, and I, you know, I like work-life balance, so I didn't do that. Um, but Chronometer really hit the sweet spot for the type of software I was developing. Uh, it, you know, really important to me was being able to track how fast or how slow different parts of the program were running. Um, also, being able to just you know run pod install and have it drop out a file automatically without me having to uh, you know run a separate command. Okay, so did a bunch of profiling and uh, it revealed a pretty fundamental problem with CocoaPods architecture. And, you know, it also showed a bunch of smaller things but they were all a lot easier to optimize. Things like don't do something inside a loop if you can do it outside the loop, you know, basic stuff like that. And so what was this big architecture problem? Well, it was graph traversal. So this is basically the performance bottleneck that all build systems end up fighting. Um, okay, fancy, fancy computer science math words. What is graph traversal? Well, here's a graph. You have A, A depends on B and C, B and C each depend on D. Pretty simple, right? 
Uh, you definitely can't read that. This is one tiny part of Square's dependency graph. Um, it is a mess. Um, this is also sort of, this is just the networking stack. Um, so, okay, so graph traversal, why is this a problem? So the problem we often face is, how do you find all the nodes or vertices, those two words are kind of interchangeable, that come after a particular one we care about? So it's kind of tempting to say, well, B and C came after A. We can use recursion to solve this. Yeah, but then you end up visiting D twice, and that may not sound like a super big deal, but go back to the big tangled dependency graph I showed you earlier, and that duplicate work really starts to add up. It's not even just CocoaPods that has this issue. Funny enough, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had an issue on our Android team where building one of their debug apps was getting super slow. That shard went from taking five minutes to timing out after two hours. And we traced this little reg regression to one line in the Android Gradle plugin that went in, did some graph traversal to collect resources, and it kept on adding the set of, uh, it kept on adding each node it visited to a set. Um, it just didn't check if the set already had that node. So we saved, what was it, uh, an hour and 55 minutes by fixing that bug. So graph traversal like this happens all over build tools, um, mostly because build tools love operating on what are called DAGs, which are directed acyclic graphs. Um, and this basically describes dependency structure. So, you know, every sort of node, whatever you want to call it, a, a target, a library, a gem, or a pod, has a list of dependencies. Those dependencies then have their own list of dependencies and so on. And the only rule is you can't have a cycle. You can't depend on something that depends on you. So, most operations involving dependency graphs care about what's called the transitive closure of a node. Uh, and that's answering the question, what are all the nodes that come after this one, no matter how far away? Not, all the, not only the ones that come directly after, but the ones that come after the ones that come after the ones that come after the ones that come after, ones that come after this node. So this is basically the fix we applied to the Android Gradle plugin. Um, obviously, that was not written in Ruby. This comes from a similar performance improvement I made in Molineo, which is Bundler and CocoaPods dependency resolver. Um, we basically go from doing the naive uh, recursive approach to having a set and only continuing to traverse if we've never seen a particular node before. Now, it turns out that this strategy is closely related to something called memoization. Um, and so if we look at this very simplified dependency graph again, if you ever see a dependency graph this small, just love it and hold it tight and never let it go. <laughs> It only gets worse from here. Um, so let's say you need some build setting for A. Uh, you know, compiled languages love having build settings. If you've ever looked in a make file, I'm sure you can find all of them. They tend to be very long and in shouty capital letters. Um, but some build setting for A, it depends on a build setting of B, C, and D. That's what we were talking about before. This can get slow. This can get really slow. And that's because we could be recomputing B, C, and D's settings when computing A's. And this gets really expensive when you keep on doing this 
for all of the intermediary nodes in the graph. So the fancy idea that we turn to is, well, don't do that. Calculate something once and then store it and return that stored value. It's pretty simple in retrospect. So this is a slightly different thing than caching, mostly because we're not concerned with any sort of invalidation. Um, if you've ever played around with Haskell, you know, memoization is the thing that lets you just write like a factorial uh, function that operates in linear time. So we're just lazily computing a value and storing it. And the next time it's needed, we just return the stored value. So if you've ever seen this style of code before, raise, raise your hands if you've ever written this. That's approximately everyone. Um, this is memoization. And it's great. I love it. Do it all the time. But you know, imagine if the return value was nil or false. Well, then the short circuiting won't kick in, and we'll need to recompute the value every time. And that's just not ideal. Instead, we turn to a more complicated version of this. And that's we say, ah, we, we're going to check if this instance variable is defined. If it is, return it. If not, well, we'll define it. Um, but even this approach has an issue. What happens if we want to reset this value? This also can get a bit weird if you have subclasses as exactly where you put the call to super can make a big difference in behavior. So in CocoaPods, I was rewriting our build settings generation because that was a huge bottleneck. And I added a, uh, well, I say a tiny little DSL. Um, there are kind of a lot of options. I guess it's not so tiny. Um, but basically, the idea was you pass in a block and you say, here's the method name you want to define, and a couple of other things. So it could do fancy stuff like deal with arrays and concatenating them and sorting and uniquing and, and all that, things that you often want to do when calculating build settings. Um, and uh, this was replacing some spaghetti code that was just a bunch of module functions that would call each other a lot. Um, and then we'd end up recomputing all these build settings over and over and over. Um, so this, you know, helper define build settings method method um, it uses an IVAR hash called memoize to store these values. It fetches from that hash, and if we don't yet have the key, then we compute it. And this is also great if you're, let's say, testing, because you can discard all that state really easily by clearing one variable. Instead of having to keep track of all of the variables that you're using if you're memoizing in line. And if we decide to be really sneaky, we can even handle that, you know, calling to super issue by using a key that, let's say, has the class name that the method is defined on inside of it. So I wrote this fancy DSL and did what I called a huge refactor. But if you take out like tests and comments and documentation and all that, it was basically 200 lines of code. Um, it allowed me to fix a really long-standing bug in build settings generation a bug that was actually preventing Square's adoption of a whole new programming language, Swift. So this was pretty important for us to fix. But these bug fixes would have slowed installation down by like a factor of two using the old, you know, call yourself recursively method. So okay, so that that was one you know, particular thing I did for CocoaPod's performance. 
that was, you know, that was like the tooling bit. And now we get on to the engineering bit. So even after all this work, and this, this work hasn't ended, we're still trying to improve CocoaPods performance. CocoaPods still isn't super fast when you hit the sort of scale that Square is at, something like 395 pods that we install. Um, and it never will be fast enough, most likely, if only because I'm the person in charge of making it fast, and I'm not that great at it. So some of the lessons learned. Um, some of these issues, unfortunately, do come down to choice of programming language. There is a reason why a bunch of us have talked about Ruby performance. Um, I know it's getting better. It's getting better all the time, and you know, stuff like Truffle Ruby is promising. But at the moment, Ruby is a kind of slow language. Um, some of this comes down to the fact that what CocoaPods does is complicated. You know, essentially build, being a build tool is hard work. There's a lot of edge cases. There's a lot of, you know, graph traversal. It's hard. It's complicated. It's slow. And most interestingly, some of this is our own fault because CocoaPods is like seven years old. And it wasn't built to scale as far as it's been pushed today. So some particulars about the design issues we've had. Mutable objects, uh, they're great. You can change anything you want on them, um, except they make memoization super hard. Your memoization problem goes to being a cache invalidation problem. Um, when you have methods that depend on each other, you can't just store the result if someone can change one of the attributes out from under you. And you need to have you know, these objects off to the side that you know, hold computed values only when it's safe to do so. So this is when you end up with like your cache objects. Because you know that at some point you're done mutating something. Uh, so it's safe to you know, compute once then. But it isn't until you know you're done mutating. Unless, you know, of course, you want to get into cache and validation bugs. That's fine. You can do that. Um, I wish you luck. You will cause issues doing that. We do a lot of, you know, file system reads and writes. Um, one of the downsides of being a build system is that people, you know, store their source code on disk. Um, and then, you know, you store configuration files on disk. Um, and disks are fast. They're not that fast, especially when you can't parallelize I.O. Um, and doing writes and reads in line with the rest of your program's logic means you can't really parallelize it safely. It makes it really hard to reason about when what is going to be touching what files on disk. So one of the things CocoaPods has always strived for is to be as user friendly as possible. And that means printing out really helpful and consistent command line interface output. But once again, this makes parallelization really hard. CocoaPods still doesn't even download artifacts in parallel. And that's because, you know, how do you show progress when you could be downloading multiple things at once? How do you show the underlying command invocations that are happening all interleaved with one another? How do you deal with failures? Um, all of these are solvable problems, but they're hard. And we wanted to spend our time building the best build system possible, um, not solving design problems. We also have a bunch of inefficient data structures. So those core, you know, those core files, the, the pod file and the pod spec, they're just built using, you know, nested hashes and arrays. They're, they're basically just storing JSON 
internally. Um, that makes tracking changes really hard, which makes cache invalidation basically impossible. It also means that oftentimes you need to recurse into you know, the different properties to try and merge them all together. And the lack of copy on write uh, in general means that whenever you're mutating stuff, you're creating lots of new objects and being defensive, or you have bugs because you're mutating objects. Um, another sort of sin copied straight from Ruby Gems is that we have our pod file and pod spec as Ruby DSLs. Um, so this, uh, you know, users will try their best to get in the way of your software working. Um, and so if they write Ruby code in these Ruby files, it's really hard to compute stable hashes of their content because a, there are multiple valid representations to compute them from, and B, someone's going to look up something from an environment variable somewhere, I promise you. Um, so this is the, the price we pay for our DSLs being Ruby rather than a pure configuration language like JSON or YAML. Um, there are other you know, non-performance foot guns sitting in this one as well. We also don't store all the information in that big value, you know, Ruby file in something that isn't Ruby. Um, so figuring out when it's changed so we can short circuit and do less work um, is basically impossible. Uh, I've got a project that I'm wrapping up right now that tries to make our tests run faster. Um, it's this gem called Refinement. Uh, you can find it on Square's GitHub page. And it, you know, we basically had to write a hook to write out all this information that we needed into a separate file on the side um, because the API that we needed to compute full model objects still takes 20 seconds to run. And it would be great if CocoaPods just stored all this stuff for us. Um, there's also an, sort of an all or nothing approach to how pod install works. Uh, it either installs things or it doesn't install things. Um, and so we had this fun idea uh, to make you know, some invocations a bit faster. Um, this only required about seven weeks of full-time work thanks to uh, my coworker Sebastian. Um, we basically now write out a bunch of cache operation, uh, you know, cache files so we can see what stuff do we actually have to recompute, what stuff do we actually have to install and then write out. Um, this saves up to a minute per pod install. So if you're, uh, you know, if you're just feeling like heating up your room in the winter and you wanted to run, you know, pod install and then pod install and then pod install and then pod install, um, you know, that used to take the same amount of time for each invocation. It was about a minute and a half to two minutes. Now, the first one, a minute and a half. The second one, 30 seconds. Um, the path name class, just, I'm not ready to talk about this. Um, the, the performance price we've observed for having a nice API is, really, really high. So at the end of the day, the design lesson we've learned is that, uh, you know, as far as CocoaPods is concerned, that the architecture decisions mattered just as much as the algorithms we were using. Um, we could make things faster by writing smarter algorithms, uh, but there was a limit to how good we could make things because we were hamstrung by an architecture that wasn't built for performance. It wasn't built for scale. Okay, so what's the future? Um, so Square's still investing heavily in this tool. A bunch of people still use it. Uh, I think once I did some back of the envelope math, and I think pod install gets run 
at least like a hundred million times a year, which is mind boggling to me. Um, you know, we love the tool and we like the way it works and we're now focusing on scale. We've been making great progress recently, super happy with um, the incremental installation work that Sebastian has done. Um, but really, this all started with that build settings refactor that inspired this talk. And we're not done yet. Um, as I said at the beginning, dealing with performance problems is an ongoing challenge. There's you know, no such thing as like, well, write a fix and then that problem is f done forever. We have you know, metrics in place to track how long different parts of the installation process take. I have graphs that um, apparently get shown in like weekly meetings um, that say, ah, this is trending upwards, this is bad. Um, we're also able to pinpoint regressions the day that we introduce them because we can see that there's a spike that happens and we can correlate it with the code we wrote that caused the regression. But no build system has yet solved the problem of scale. Um, it's something that's a really hot topic still in the compiled language world. Um, you know, Facebook put out their Buck project. Um, Google has Blaze, which they then open sourced and you know changed the name to Bazel. Um, you know these things are really exciting, but it turns out making build systems performant is a fundamentally hard problem. And our work on you know making CocoaPods in particular faster is probably never going to be done. So, thank you. I, uh, I think we've got some time for a few questions, if anyone has any. Thank you, Samuel. For you. And this was our last talk, was our last hour together. Do we have questions? There's a question over there. Uh, so, one of the nice things about working at a big company with a bunch of iOS developers is I can force them to give me metrics. Um, uh, so, no, we, we don't collect those metrics like, you know, by default in CocoaPods. Um, it's, a, it's a little plugin I wrote that, you know, goes in and uses Chronometer to hook all of the existing, you know, or some of the existing methods and report those timings, um, you know, back up to a logging server that we have. Um, but for us, that's kind of all we care about. Um, it's really nice to make the open source tool better, and I love doing that, and I've been doing that for five years. Um, but my day job is specifically to make the experience for Squares developers better. And so I get to track that very directly. Yeah, I mean, that's the benefit of being Google scale. <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd love to have those metrics, and I'd love it if it was easier for open source projects to track those sort of sorts of things. There's a reason that, you know, our businesses track metrics and, you know, run A-B tests and have 
you know, server-controlled feature flags, um, it, those are tools that genuinely help make for better products. Um, it's just not yet a solved problem for how to do that in an affordable and you know, secure and privacy-preserving and open way for open source projects yet. More questions? Looks like we're good then. Thank you. Thank you.